Oh, I'm early. I'm 30 seconds early. Good morning. You have 30 seconds to find your way in. Oh, no, I'm not 30 seconds. I'm one second early. All right. Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Presbyterian Church. Come on in and find a seat. Welcome. Sorry to interrupt all of these great conversations. Um, I'm Pastor Dan Warren. It's my privilege to welcome you this morning to worship. Please take out your bulletin and turn to the front page. I thought I was going to mess that up and say back page. Turn to the front page, the inside cover of your bulletin. I want to highlight a few announcements and make a couple of corrections. Come on in, everyone, and turn to the inside cover of your bulletin. Just a few things to highlight. First, uh, be praying for six high school students, uh, young men who are at Majnik. If you're new to Heritage, like me, you probably thought, what in the world is Majnik? Maybe it's the first time you've heard that word. It's a high school retreat, and that's kingdom spelled backwards. So pray for the high schoolers who have been away at Majnik this weekend, and for ruling elder Daniel Brewer, who has valiantly taken up the cause of being there with them. And I'm sure this has been a great time. Pray for their safe return and for their spiritual encouragement. Okay, going down the list of announcements, HPC 101 after worship. That's not what we're doing. We're doing Missions Committee 101. Uh, we've already finished, uh, yes, happy dance from Katie Hutchison. We've already finished HPC 101, so if you were in that class, stay in here after worship. Uh, we're going to have a brief presentation from the Missions Committee on the nature of what the committee does, and also a, a little bit of a, a more detail on a few of our missionaries. I think we're highlighting four areas of ministry. So stay here after that. It won't go for the whole hour because we need to flip this room uh, for our fellowship meal. Uh, high school students, you can come in here as well uh, instead of going to your Sunday school class. And then we'll flip that for the fellowship meal. If you're visiting or if you were running out the door and forgot and didn't bring a, you know, a plate to share, please stay anyway. And for those of you who did bring a plate to share, don't worry about it now. Focus on worship. It's now up to the crockpot and the Lord, like we say. <laughs> uh, Men's Tuesday Morning Theology is carrying on at 6 a.m. at Chick-fil-A in Warrington, going through a wonderful little book on the people of God. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you're interested in getting together with the men uh, at 6 a.m. and studying through this book, uh, you can talk to Alden Fay. Where's Alden? I don't know if he's here today. You can talk to Alden, and he can give you more information about that. A youth group is this week here at HPC uh, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, two more. We're almost done. Alita Dean's uh, baby shower will be at 3 p.m. here at Heritage, and you can RSVP in Realm events for that. Look on Realm. If you're not on Realm, talk to me or one of the elders. Talk to Ryan McCall. We'd love to get you connected. That's where all of the communication really happens here. So look for that on Realm, ladies. Finally, I'll mention uh, Deacon Workday, April 27th. We like to mention that this isn't the workday that is only for the deacons. It's called Deacon Workday because they're putting this together for all of us to participate in things that need to be done here around the church. So if you're able to come out for that, uh, please make time to come and participate. I think that is all of the announcements. So let's take a moment now, quiet our hearts as we prepare to worship our triune God. Well, if you're able, I would invite you to please stand for this morning's call to worship. This is more than just a welcome or an invitation. This is the creator of the universe who has called us his own people by the sacrifice of Christ for our sins. He is calling us this morning to worship him. And we gratefully respond uh, with praise and worship this morning. The call to worship today is from Psalm 146, verse 10 which we'll hear in French and Spanish and English. L'Éternel règne éternellement, ton Dieu au Sion, subsiste d'âge en âge, louez l'Éternel. 
en español. El Señor reinará para siempre, tu Dios, oh Sion, por todas las generaciones. Aleluya. In English, the Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Please take out your hymnals and we will sing our hymn of praise, number 53. Number 53, praise to the Lord the Almighty. Our good and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, your people, gathered by your word in your spirit, give you glory and praise today, for no one, nothing in this world compares with you. There is nothing we long for that can satisfy us. You satisfy your people with every good thing. For this we long to desire and seek after you. We want our hearts to say with the sons of Korah, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so our souls pant for you, O God. Our souls thirst for God, for the living God. Father in heaven, you give every perfect gift, and you never change. You cast no shadow of uncertainty or shifting will and love for your people. Give us a heart that longs for you. We know that you draw us to yourself, and in turn, you fill us. We praise you for your kind pursuit of your children, with grace and love, for our good and your glory. Lord Jesus, we are so in awe that you, eternally glorious and equal in substance, power, and glory with God, the Word who was in the beginning with God and who was God, you became man. 
you, the eternally glorious and powerful God, became like us in our weakness. You became like us for our salvation. You became the servant to save us, submitting yourself to the Father's will and obtaining by our obedience, by your obedience and sacrifice, the freedom of we, your people, and our blessing forever as your undeserving, loving subjects. We praise you for you are God and you are the man, Christ Jesus, who saves. Holy Spirit, these things are too great for us to grasp on our own. So we pray for your enlightening work. Open our eyes to see wonderful things in the word you inspired. And for this, your work on our behalf, clearing away the barriers and limitations that blind us to Jesus and his grace. For this gracious work, we give you thanks and praise. Now we, your people, join our voices in prayer, using those words with which our Savior taught us to pray, praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as we prepare now to hear God's law leading us to confess our sins and to hear his gospel uh, leading us to assurance and joy in our salvation, I want to share a quote with you. I think I've shared it with you before, uh, but it relates to this morning's sermon. Uh, this is from Walter Marshall, a 17th century pastor who wrote a book called The Gospel Mystery of Sanctification. And Marshall says this, The difference between the law and the gospel does not at all consist in this, that the one requires perfect doing, the other only sincere doing. But in this, that the one requires doing, the other not doing, but believing for life and salvation. Their terms are different, not only in degree, but in their whole nature. Again, what Marshall is saying here is that the law requires doing and the gospel requires not doing, but believing. What is this law and what does it require? Uh, hear now God's law from Exodus 20, this summary of God's moral law and a witness to his infinite holiness. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make a graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. We fall short of these 10 words. We fall short of God's law. Because of that, we confess this morning our sins uh, before God, uh, first silently, personally, and then we will do so together uh, with one voice as a congregation. So please, for a moment now, uh, please confess your sins silently. Let us pray.
Let's join our voices together now in confession using this prayer that is in your bulletin. Praying together. Oh, our dearest Lord Jesus Christ, you know our poor souls and great transgressions, and we cry out to you alone with open hearts. We are sorry that we have neither the will nor the intentions we should, and fall behind daily, for we are poor, sick sinners. You know that we want to have good will and good intentions, but our foe strikes and leads us captive. Redeem us, poor sinners, according to your divine will. Deliver us from all evil and all afflictions. Strengthen and increase in us true Christian faith. Give us grace to faithfully love our neighbors as ourselves with all our hearts. Give us patience and perseverance in all persecution and trouble. You told Peter not to forgive only seven times, and you have called us to come to you for consolation. So we come up with the assurance of what you have pledged, and cry to you as our true pastor and overseer of our souls in all our needs. You alone know how and when we need your help. Your will be done, and your name be praised forever. Amen. Well, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to make our way through Luke 15, where from the teaching of Jesus, we have these wonderful pictures of the gospel. So hear now uh, this assurance from the gospel in Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. If by faith you've turned to Jesus, then Jesus has found you. No matter how messed up you are, or no matter how you've failed in obeying Jesus this week, he's found you. He gathers his friends and says, let's have a party, because I have found this one, and he, she, is mine. If that's your only hope this morning, not everything you've done or not done, but what Jesus has done for you, and by faith, you're running to the one who sought you and found you. And I have good news for you this morning, Christian. As a minister of the gospel, I declare to you that because of this faith in Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and you can worship God in peace. Please take out now your bulletins, and we will sing our song of assurance. The song of assurance, Grace, which is printed in your bulletin. Please stand if you're able.
You may be seated. I'm Ed Faudry, one of the ruling elders here at Heritage. Welcome to our service this morning. I'd like to begin by noting that our opening hymn this morning was based on Psalm 103. And so now hear the verses, verses 10 through 14. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Join with me in prayer now. O merciful Father, who abounds in steadfast love and great compassion, praise you that you are constant in love and mercy, ever ready to reveal salvation to all who call upon your name. You take from us our sin and the curse of our sin, removing them from us to send them away to an infinite distance. And you give us gifts, making us your sons and daughters. We live in the shadow of your protective wings, ever cared for and guarded from ultimate harm. Praise you for your constant and continual faithfulness to us, even when we are unfaithful, because you have placed your name upon us, and we are forever yours. Lord, we thank you for all the churches in this country that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ regardless of their denominational affiliation or lack of one. And we especially thank you for Christ Presbyterian Church in Burke. We ask that you bless the pastor, Porter Harlow, the session and the diaconate, and all the members of the congregation as they share the gospel with friends and neighbors. We ask that they may soon be able to move out of rented space and establish their own place in the town of Burke and so be able to have more opportunity for ministry and support to their community. We thank you that this June they will be celebrating their fifth anniversary of holding services. They are holding a missions conference and beginning new officer training. Father, thank you for the growth that has been seen in that church. We know it is all your doing. We thank you as well for the missionaries that all our churches send and support. We thank you for Dan and Carol Iverson who have served for 36 years in Japan. We thank you for Dan's leadership as the Tokyo team leader and as Mission to the World Japan director. Continue to bless his ministry and Carol's as she serves as the principal and teacher for the Covenant Community School International. Lord, we also seek your grace for this church as we make progress towards enhancing our ministries and being better stewards of the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. We seek your favor on our elders and deacons and for our diaconal candidates as they learn what becoming a deacon is all about in the diaconal training class. Confirm in them this calling or that you are saying not yet for each of them. Prepare us as we begin to search for an associate pastor to share the load of ministry with Dan Warren as this church continues to grow in numbers and in efforts to teach and disciple so many of all ages. Help us to determine and plan out a full-orbed ministry of discipleship so that there is opportunity for all to be properly discipled. Make known to us who will become the ministry assistant to help us coordinate ministries across this church and be a presence in the front office to welcome all who pass through our doors. Father, we pray for those of us who are isolated at home or in care facilities and who may be able to join us via the live stream for worship. May we not forget them and visit them routinely so that we, they may know that, that they are part of this community. We also ask that you give your people who will care for aging parents special encouragement, wisdom, rest, strength, and patience. This time is wearing on those of us who would otherwise be enjoying days of retirement but instead give up that time to minister to parents who can no longer take care of themselves. We ask your blessing for those with special requests, for those in our midst who are recovering from illness, our Dean and Joyce, 
Duncan and Peggy, Bill, Anna, and others. We thank you for the birth of Tanya and Nora, and we look forward to the birth of Robbie and Alita's baby. Keep mother and child safe and healthy through childbirth. Lord, we would desire to see peace and justice in our land, that all would be treated equally, justly, under the law of our land. We see too many lawbreakers go free to steal and kill again, and too many others as treated as criminals, all because of which side of the political divide they are on. We desire to see the end of political polarization and everyone be treated fairly and equitably. We would have your peace upon our land, your blessings attend our ways, because we seek to live according to your gospel, living at peace with all our neighbors. And as we face rising tensions in our world with an ongoing war in Ukraine, war in Israel with the Gaza Palestinians, and now Iran actively firing on Israel, we pray that such wars would end. We would see the extension of gospel peace over all those who do not believe, so that they may have the opportunity to hear the gospel unimpeded, and even a peace that allows men and women of any belief to be able to do good to their neighbors. For you, O oh Lord, extend a beneficence and a benevolence to all mankind as your common grace to us. Finally, good Father, we ask your blessings upon the gift of offerings and upon the givers, whether we give now in this place or have give or have yet to give via mail or online. We know that you desire us to give a portion back to you as we acknowledge all that we, have, that we have comes from you and that we depend upon your grace even to have an income. Use these gifts to build up your church, reach across the world with the good news of the gospel, and help those in need. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask now the uh, ushers to come forward to collect tithes and offerings. As is our habit here, we read from the opposite testament to the passage that is used for the sermon. And this week, we will be reading from Deuteronomy chapter 27, the entire chapter. Um, if you did not bring a, your own copy of the scriptures with you today, you can find it in the Pew Bible beginning on page 198. So Deuteronomy 27, this is the second giving of the law as Moses as his farewell song to the nation of Israel, uh, reviews the law with them and gives them further commands. Beginning with verse 1, Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment that I command you today. And on the day that you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster. And you shall write on them all the words of this law when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord, the God of your fathers, have promised you. And when you have crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today 
on Mount Ebel, and you shall plaster them with plaster. And there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones. And you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God, and you shall sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, and you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. Then Moses and the Levitical priests said to all Israel, Keep silence and hear, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. That day Moses charged the people, saying, When you have crossed over the Jordan, there shall stand on the Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on my Ebel for the curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulon, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall declare to you to all the men of Israel in a loud voice. Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his father's wife because he has uncovered his father's nakedness, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with any kind of animal, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his sister, whether the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Those are the curses of the covenant. I find it interesting that in Samaritanism, which is a now recognized offshoot of Judaism, that they believe that the proper place to worship God is atop Mount Gerizim, for an altar was built there by, Josiah, by, by Joshua, they say. This re-editing of the book of Moses and of Joshua was done to justify the new religious practices at the time of the creation of the northern kingdom of Israel after the death of King Solomon. However, the text we just read says there is an altar to be built on Mount Ebel. So we have the difference between the mountain of blessing, Mount Gerizim, and the mountain of curses, Mount Ebal. The idea of an altar on the mountain of curses points to the idea that a sacrifice is needed. We cannot live under a system that allows curses to stand forever. We need to have sin and the attendant curses atoned for. That's why God commanded an altar for burnt offering to be placed on Mount Ebel. Today, we have the atoning for sin and its curses in Christ when by faith we are joined in union with him. Praise be to God. And now, children, if you are third grade, 10 years old or so, or younger, please come forward. Pastor Dan has a message just for you. Hey, good morning, everybody. Come on up. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Oh, this is my water. I might, I might fall over if you take my water. I'll hide it right here. Is that silly? Hi, Sophie. All right. I don't have any toys. I don't have any objects. I just have a story for you. Do you guys like stories? Yeah. Let me ask you a question first. 
Now, Mr. Fadri did an excellent job reading Deuteronomy 27, but did any of that make sense to you? Uh, maybe no, not so much. All right, well, here's the thing. The way you heard that, and it kind of was hard to understand, I think that's kind of what it was like to be someone living in Antioch or another city in Galatia when they heard Paul's preaching for the very first time. Bless you. They heard Paul's preaching for the very first time, and they were like, what is Paul talking about? He's talking about a God we've never heard of and covenants that we don't know anything about, and this Jesus who maybe sort of kind of we've heard something happen in Jerusalem. And Paul takes the time to explain what the gospel is and what it means. And then people have come, and they're, they're mixing things up for these people, and they're changing the message, and they're making it not a message of good news, but a message of you need to do more if you really want to be saved. And so Paul goes to fix the problem. He writes Galatians to explain what's happening. Now, I got a story for you, and then I'm going to point out how it relates to the sermon. So come on over here. Have you ever locked yourself out of the house? Has your dad ever locked you out? My brother Your brother has. has? I knew somebody had. I locked myself out. I locked myself out the other day when... I was the only one here, and everybody was in Mexico. So I'm not going to tell you how I got into my house, because I don't want anyone to break into my house. But I got in, and I felt like a ninja. But I got into my house. Well, one time, uh, Mariana and Sophia and Piper and I, we were at a lake house. We were at a friend's house uh, taking a week to uh, just have a vacation. And we had, you remember that? All right, don't give it away. And we were leaving, and the whole car was packed up. It had been a good week, and we're getting ready to leave. And guess what I did? Pastor Dan locked the keys in the car. And we were all ready to go. All of our stuff was in the car. Even if we had to stay another night, there were no locksmiths open. And it was really far away. So we might have had to stay inside with none of our stuff. And so I thought, I'm going to get this door open. Do you know how long I tried to get that door open? It took me like two hours, right? It took me about two hours. I used a football and an air pump and a wire hanger, and eventually I got it open. But Paul is going to talk to us today in Galatians 3 about a door that's closed and about, about a door that's open. Now, he doesn't use the word door. I'm using that so that we can understand it. It's something that we can, we can see as a picture. Let me read you about these two doors really quick, okay? I'm going to read this to you, and then we'll talk about it in the sermon, okay? So, he says, the law is not of faith. So he's going to make two differences, right? There's the law over on this side, and there's faith over on the other side. Law, do. Everybody say that. Law, do. Faith, believe. Let's try it again. Law, do. Faith, believe. Those are two doors. Two ways, hypothetically, you could get to God. But there's a problem. Only one of the doors is open. Which door do you think is open? Faith. faith. That's right. Faith and belief. So we're going to look at that today and see how there are two doors, but there's only one way. Can you repeat that after me? Two doors. Two doors. One, way. one way. And now, who thinks they can say what that one way is? Faith. I heard faith. Katie? God, that's right, faith in God. I thought I would get the Sunday school answer. Jesus is the only way, right? Jesus is the only way. So, well, he is the key. That's actually really good. Actually, there was someone who said the law is, the law locks all of us up, and the gospel is the key that lets us out. So that's actually really observant. All right, go on back to your seats, and then we'll look at this in the sermon, okay? Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. After three weeks, we are back in the book of Galatians. If you're using a pew Bible, this is found on page 1155, 1155. Galatians chapter 3. So Paul continues his no-holds-barred confrontation of this false teaching that's been troubling the Galatians. And now he's going to reach back to the storyline of Scripture to explain how it's always been the case 
that sinners like us only come to him by faith. So if you found Galatians 3, 10 to 14, please stand, if you would, for the reading of God's word. This is Galatians 3, 10 to 14. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. So far the reading of God's Word. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth now and the meditation of our hearts together be pleasing to you. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Parents, grandparents too, uh, do you remember when your kid or your grandkid had their first big sugar high? Their first big sugar high. Just completely hopped up on sugar. And let's be honest, grandparents, it was probably your fault. (laughs) Not mom and dad's. My grandma used to call me up uh, before I came to visit. Grandson, what's your favorite pop? This was Kansas, so we said pop. Grandson, what's your favorite pop? What are you drinking these days? And do you want ice cream sandwiches or drumsticks? And I knew I was in for the time of my life. (laughs) Ice cream sandwiches, drumsticks, and Cartoon Network in 10-hour shifts, and I was up for the challenge. I remember when it happened to Sophie, the very first time. I remember like it was yesterday. She was almost two, and a dear friend of ours Uh, brought over these fantastic gourmet cupcakes with icing like two inches thick on top. And Sophie ate half of one, maybe not even, and it was wild. She was wild. It was like bouncing a hard rubber ball indoors, just do, 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 do. And then she took off running across the room and ran straight into a closed closet door, (laughs) just bounced right off the door. The sad reality about all of that, friends, is that some of you here this morning are so hyped up on self-righteousness and your own abilities that you're running head first for a closed door and you may not even know it. Uh, You're confident in your ability to obey God, to please Him, to do good works, uh, to be on His good side because of the good things that you can do, and you're headed straight for a closed door. And it's laughable. We laugh about Uh, our kids running around like crazy on sugar. Uh, But this isn't something really to laugh about. Uh, It would be laughable. It's kind of silly, in fact, when you step back and think about it. But this isn't a cute social media media video in the making or uh, some cute story that someone will tell their friends. This is life or death. This is heartache, sorrow, eternal loss if you don't correct course and give it up and look to Jesus. So some of you are surely there, but some of you have surely wisened up a bit. Uh, You've wisened up, but only enough to realize you can't do enough good to get to God, and you're in danger of giving up this morning. So whether you're hyped up on self-righteousness or you're hopeless in self-condemnation, my prayer is that what we would see in this passage in Galatians would take us all to Jesus, the one who has borne the curse of the law in our place. He's done all that's needed, all that's required to open the way to life for everyone who turns to him. What I want to show you this morning as we look to Galatians 3, 10 to 14, uh, is, is that there's only one answer. There's only one way to God. There's two alternatives that Paul lays out for us here, but only one is the answer. Jesus has made the way. He's opened the only way to life with God. He's taken our curse, our sin upon himself to bring us the promised life of the Spirit. So to gather our thoughts today, uh, just two points, uh, two alternatives, uh, two doors to choose from. Uh, Door on the left, door on the right, that kind of thing. Two doors. First, the closed door of doing. And secondly, the open door of believing. The closed door of doing and the open door of believing. So let's look at the first door. 
the closed door of doing. Look with me again at Galatians 10, 3, 10 through 12. We read this. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. So as you can tell looking at this, Paul is quoting the scriptures. And he's assuming a familiarity with the scriptures that we might not have uh, just offhand. Not so much as these believers, perhaps, to whom he's writing. And certainly not so much as the false teachers who had grown up with the Jewish scriptures and who were dragging these Gentile new believers back into bondage, away from the freedom of the gospel, and back into bondage under the old covenant. We have a running joke at our house uh, for a few years now. I get busy with an email or a text or, you know, just going on to do the next thing, and Mariana will say, wait, don't go. Tell me about covenant theology. What's the covenant of works again? What was the covenant of grace And something along those lines. And she's good, isn't she? Because she knows that's a topic that will cause a record scratch in my brain. And I'll sit down and talk for a really long time. Uh, Well, at this point in Paul's letter to the Galatians, uh, he's sitting down to talk to them about covenant theology. He's, He's diving into covenant theology, this unfolding story of God's covenants with man in Scripture. And this is the heart of his of his argument against the false teaching that was going on in Galatia. So in order to track with Paul and what he's saying here, uh, we probably need a refresher about what he's referring to. Uh, This is really one of the reasons I thought taking us through Galatians would be a good idea, because it affords us the opportunity to explore God's covenants that he's made in Scripture and see how these things really fit together uh, in the way we understand uh, what's called covenant theology. So the next several passages in Galatians will help us with this. and It's going to give us a window into the storyline of Scripture and help us see how all of these things relate to the good news of the gospel. So to get at this first point, the closed door of doing, uh, we need to understand why Paul is citing the Old Testament Scriptures that he's citing. Why is he taking us back to the covenants in this way? So under this first point, let's look at the big picture and then the big problem. First, the big picture behind what Paul is after here, and then that'll take us to the big problem Uh, a big problem for all of us. So big picture, Paul is taking the Galatians back to what the Mosaic Covenant required. Remember, uh, the false teachers being, uh, you know, the false teachers promoting this return to Judaism at the same time as believing in Jesus, we call them the Judaizers. Uh, They were preaching gospel and Moses, gospel and Moses, gospel and law. Paul often just says law when he's referring to the Mosaic Covenant, so we will too. Uh, Regarding the law, Paul quotes two key passages here. Deuteronomy 27, 28. Deuteronomy 27, 28 for note takers, slower. And Leviticus 18, 5. I'm sure all of you did your devotions this morning in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Like the great theologian Robert Duvall said, I love the smell of Deuteronomy and Leviticus in the morning, right? Stay with me here. Uh, This can be be hard, but it's important because it takes us through the big picture to the big problem that we have. So Paul, why in the world would you go to Deuteronomy 27, 28, and why do I care? Um, Well, we heard Deuteronomy 27, 28 just moments ago, this morning. It's the climax of the curses that would come upon Israel if they didn't faithfully obey God once they entered the promised land. Cursed, or cursed, be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. And all the people did say, Amen. Now let's take a moment to remember something important. Uh, Our confessions as Presbyterians, the Westminster Standards, uh, they call the Mosaic Covenant an administration of the covenant of grace. That is to say that God, during this period of the Mosaic Covenant that he made with his people, uh, he worked his grace. He worked his grace through the covenant he made with them. He delivered them out of bondage in Egypt. Yes, Israel was brought out of Egypt by the mighty hand of God. 
Yes, God declared his saving work right on the cusp of delivering the Ten Commandments to them. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Yes, God gave Israel the sacrifices and ordinances that held forth hope in a promised Redeemer who would come. And for all of these things, uh, the Mosaic Covenant is what we call uh, an administration of the covenant of grace. We group the various covenants into these categories. There's precedent for that in Scripture. Psalm 105, Joshua 24, Hebrews 8, many different covenants, ways that God has related to man and to his people. But those that share these things in common can be grouped together and referred to together. So we say that the Mosaic Covenant is an administration, one way of God administering this covenant of grace. But, and it's a big difference, there are big differences here. And that's what Paul is highlighting. He's not so much talking about the similarities. The differences is the point. There are big differences between the promise to Abraham and the law given by Moses. So yes, there's grace in the Mosaic economy, but with respect to Israel's tenure or their stay in the promised land, you've brought us into the promised land, how do we stay in the promised land? With respect to that, as a national covenant that God made with Israel at Sinai in service of this bigger picture of grace at play, there's this principle of works with regard to staying in the land. There's this principle in the law that was heavy and hard, impossible, impossible, in fact, because of sin. There's a reason God says in Ezekiel 20, 24, Moreover, I gave them statutes that were not good and rules by which they could not have life. So eternal life with God. You're an individual Israelite, and you're wondering, how can I be right with God? That's always been by faith. It's always been by grace. Salvation was then, and it is now, only by the grace of God, but as a picture of the judgment that was coming and this need for Jesus that we all share, not good rules were given to them. God gave them rules that were not good, that could not lead to life. He designed this covenant so that the nation of Israel, they could give up their right to the promised land, and that pointed to a greater reality. It pointed to this reality that they couldn't keep the land by keeping the law, much less could they earn God's favor and earn the right to heaven by keeping the law. That's what Paul's driving at here. That's the point. Israel's eventual exile was a sad witness to the inability of sinful people like them and like us to confirm the words of the law by doing them. Not for life in the land and certainly not for eternal life with God. That was always meant to be by faith in the promise given to Abraham, pictured in the sacrifices, pointing forward to Jesus. And Paul quotes another passage from the law here that again underscores the fact that the law of Moses is something no Galatian in their right mind and no believer in any time, anywhere, even today should want to return to, especially for being made right with God. Leviticus 18.5, which Paul quotes, says, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. But what, what if a person doesn't do them? Well, then they're exiled from Cana, from Canaan. They're banished from Eden, going back in the story. You see, Israel's story replays Adam's story and reminds us, it reminds all of us that something's got to give if we're going to be made right with God. If we're going to have rock-solid assurance that we're accepted by God, it's not something that we can do. It's not something that can come from us. So we'll spend more time in the coming weeks on this contrast between the law and gospel, Moses and Abraham, works and faith, because that's where Paul is going to be uh, for the next chapter or two. Uh, But for now, this big picture look that life could not come from the law, that even under Moses, they were always meant to run to something else. Uh, It takes us to the big problem. The big problem is this. It's sin, simply put. The problem is sin. In retrospect, when we look back and we see the Israelites standing at Mount Ebal and we hear them saying, all that is spoken in the words of the law we will do, we almost want to say, no, don't do it, don't say amen, because we know in retrospect they'll never do it. And we know, examining our own hearts, that we would never do it. We can't do it. There's no way we could possibly obey the law perfectly. We think that. We think, man, I would have known better than to sign that dotted line. 
But I'm not so sure that we've learned our lesson as much as we may hope. It's our nat- natural inclination, isn't it, to want a list to complete uh, and to feel confident when we've completed the list, to feel up when we've obeyed God and then to feel down when we've disobeyed God, to try and Kool-Aid man our way through the closed door of doing. Remember the Kool-Aid man? Some of you are too young for the Kool-Aid man. Now. Oh, yeah, bust through the brick wall, right? We try to Kool-Aid our man through the closed door of doing thinking we have what it takes to earn God's favor. And this is where it gets practical, friends. This is, I was writing the sermon and thinking, man, lots of covenant theology and do this and don't do that. And what, where does it actually get practical here? When you get home Thursday afternoon and you're down in the dumps because you argued with your spouse on the way out of the door to work, you got disgruntled on the inside, hopefully, uh, with your boss or that coworker who annoys you, rubs you the wrong way, or, young person, you cut corners on your schoolwork, you lied, uh, you cheated, you did everything wrong, and you feel guilty about it, and everything seems off, and God feels far away. When you're going through that, and you're feeling like, man, I am just so distant from God that he could never, ever accept me, and I just can't believe myself and how horrible I am, that's not because God is far away. That's not because of anything that you did that was surprising to God. It's because you failed to be the Kool-Aid man you thought you were. And you failed to be the superhero lawkeeper that you thought you could be. And now you're moping about it instead of looking to Jesus about it. That's what's happening. You'll be far better off and more at peace when you realize that God's not mad at you. God's not mad at you. And he wants you leaning on his grace and power to obey him and not your own puny willpower to follow his commandments. So, big application point. Stop trying to Kool-Aid man your way through the closed door of doing Stop trying to get into God's favor by what you can do or how you can obey. You can't do it. Sin keeps you from doing it. It keeps you from doing it. You cannot obey God's law law perfectly because of sin. There's no halfway when it comes to God's law. You remember James. We went through James earlier. James 4.10. What does it say? For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Is that something we want to return to and say that we could possibly take up as our way to salvation? Yoda himself said it, and if Yoda said it, you know it's true. Do or do not, there is no try. That's the covenant of works. That's the law. There is no try. There is do or do not. There is no in between. There is no halfway when it comes to obeying the law to be justified. That's why no one will ever be justified by the law. Paul says as much. It is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. Why? Because of the big problem, because of sin. The Galatians were in danger of being dragged back into trying and relying on that well-meaning agreement. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We'll believe and we'll try hard instead of relying on the it is finished that Jesus declared from the cross. You can't do it. If you're relying on works, if you're relying on the law, you're going to run straight into the closed door of doing. Like someone told me about my mom's Boston Terrier. Uh, You're running a 100-yard dash in a 90-yard room. And it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. You can't do it. What's the answer then? Is there an answer? Is there a way back to God if we can't do it by ourselves? Well, there is an answer, and it's glorious, because the answer takes us to Jesus. So, we've seen the closed door of doing with the big picture of the law's demands and the big problem of our sin and inability. I think it's time for good news. So, let's look at door number two, the open door of believing. Look with me again at Galatians 3, starting in verse 11. We skipped over it, but Paul tips his hand about where he's going in verse 11. He says, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For, this is the reason, the righteous shall live by faith. Or to really make the point stand out, what Paul is quoting here from Habakkuk, as he does also in Romans, uh, it says literally, the righteous by faith shall live. Uh, Someone I was reading this week, he pointed this out, it was really helpful. This statement in Habakkuk is written to people Uh, Paul's quoting from the prophet uh, Habakkuk, writing to these people who had failed miserably and had faced exile. And Habakkuk's answer wasn't, you need to double down on the law and be more obedient. That's your problem, Israel. You just need to do more. 
No, that's the closed door of doing. What Habakkuk said and what Paul picks up on here as as this continuing theme, uh, he says, stop doing and start believing. The righteous by faith shall live. That was always the answer. Well, what does this faith look to? When you're at the end of yourself and you've, you realize that you've bloodied your nose against the closed door of doing and you're so disillusioned with your inability to do more and to try harder that you're ready to give up, uh, if that's where you are or maybe that's where you're headed, if you're not there now, you will get there if you keep running at the closed door of doing. When you get to that point and you realize, I need help from outside of myself, where does faith look? What is the answer? What's the alternative that really saves? Well, the alternative is looking to Jesus, who has opened the door of believing, and it's the only way. Look at Galatians 3, 13. Paul takes us here to Jesus. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What the law pointed us to then, it still points us to now. It's always been saying, look away from yourself and look to Jesus. Archibald Alexander, he was the first president of Princeton Seminary. He wrote this wonderfully rich little book. It's not very well known. It's called A Brief Compend of Biblical Truth. It was written to put doctrine in simple terms, Uh, for the instruction of the blind, at a school for the blind. And he says this about the sacrifices that were offered under the Old Covenant. He says, The moral law, the Ten Commandments, the law that we've been speaking of, was binding on man by nature, but it had become so much obliterated that it became necessary to republish it, that the people having the true standard of duty before them might be convinced of their sins and driven to seek refuge in the atoning blood so copiously shed on the Jewish altar. The moral law continues to do that same work on our hearts. It's a rule of life that charts the way of the good life, the way of the Christian life. But when we consider how it reveals God's holiness and our desperate, sinful hearts, it drives us back to Jesus. It drives us to him. Jesus has done everything that's required to open the door of believing so that we can freely enter in, not by the law, but by faith in the promise. Paul continues to appeal to Scripture, Scriptures that we're not that familiar with. When he says, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, what is he referring to? Deuteronomy 21, 22 and 23. It says, if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and... You hang him, his dead body, on a tree. His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. The curse language here is illustrative of Paul's point. Uh, Presumably, uh, Craig Keener points this out, I think helpfully. He says the false teachers emphasize the cursedness of not obeying the law. Right? So imagine you're a new believer in Galatia and you've put your faith in Jesus and along come these Judaizing uh, false teachers and they say, oh, but didn't you read Deuteronomy 27? It said, cursed is everyone who doesn't obey all the laws has spoken. So if you don't want to be cursed by God, you have to have gospel and law obedience. What does Paul come along and say? He reframes his opponent's arguments and he says, all that the law requires, that's the requirement. You forgot that, didn't you? All, it says all, all that the law requires you must do. No one can do all that the law requires. That's what Paul is doing here. Almost no one can do it, that is. Thankfully, praise be to God, there is someone who can do all that the law requires. There's one who did. God himself, God the Son, who was born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. One who, despite all of his law-keeping obedience, he experienced death in the place of our all-breaking disobedience to the law. In every way we failed, he accomplished it. And yet, even still, he was cursed for our inability to obey it all. The manner of his death highlighted the curse he was taking on himself. 
to set lawbreakers, cursed sinners like us, free from condemnation. Not just Jewish lawbreakers, but Jew and Gentile alike. All sinners stand equally condemned by the law and equally in need of Jesus. That's what Paul's saying here. He opened the door of believing the only way of life to God, uh, and he opened it for everyone. Galatians 3.14, it says, So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. He's returning to a theme, isn't he? If you remember back in Galatians 3, 1 through 8, he says, So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Uh, These things all hang together. So remember what he says in Galatians 3, 1 and following. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has put the evil eye on you? Who has cast a spell on you? It was before your eyes that Christ Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. That's the answer. But let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Now notice here how he connects works of the law with this old day, this old era of the flesh before the new day of the Spirit, which has come because of Jesus. He says, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh, by works of the law? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then, verse 7, that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Verse 14 of our text, So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham shockingly, might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So it all comes down to this, friends. Will you keep banging your head against the closed door of doing, as we all tend to do, or will we walk by faith through the open door of believing? Those are the two doors, and there's only one way. In closing, let me read you just one of the most masterful summaries of our passage. This is from J. Gresham Machen, 20th century Presbyterian pastor and scholar. He talks about the two doors and the one way. Uh, He calls them doing and receiving. Doing and receiving. Machen says, these words, he who has done them shall live in them. Paul means to say, describe the nature of the law. It requires doing for something. But faith is the opposite of doing. So when the scripture says that a man is justified by faith, That involves saying that he is not justified by anything he does. There are two conceivable ways of salvation. One way is to keep the law perfectly, to do the things that the law requires. No mere man since the fall has accomplished that. The other way is to receive something, to receive something that is freely given by God's grace. That way is followed when a man has faith, but you cannot possibly mingle the two. You might conceivably be saved by works, or you might be saved by faith, but you cannot be saved by both. It is either or here, not both and. But which shall it be, works or faith? The Scripture gives the answer. The Scripture says it is faith, therefore it is not works. I think one of the most important and most difficult things that we will do in our Christian lives is to learn not to mingle the two. Machen says, don't mingle the two, friends. Law and gospel, these are two different ways to life with God. It's the closed door of doing or the open door of believing. Don't look to the law to get to God. Look to the law to live the good life that God has laid out for you, Christian, but do not look to the law to get to God. Look to Jesus, the one who, undergoing the curse for us, opened the only way to life with God. He took that curse on himself to bring us the promised life of the Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, far too often we're guilty of beating our heads against the brick wall of the law, bloodying our assurance and peace against the closed door of doing. Some of your people here today are so misguided and disgusted 
with our inability to do that we're in despair. So lift our eyes to Jesus today. He who knew no sin, who became sin for us, who became cursed for us, to redeem us, to purchase us out of the grip of the law's demands. Help us to look always and only to Jesus and to receive by faith everything you hold out to us in him alone. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as we prepare now to celebrate this meal of grace, I invite you to take out your bulletin and we will confess our faith together, uh, standing on the past uh, for wisdom in the present. We will confess our faith this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. You can remain seated for this. Christians, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father, through whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. Amen. Please join me in singing the doxology. Praise God from our confession of sin and assurance of pardon this morning, we read from Luke 15 the problem that people had with Jesus. And they said, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. I was traveling this past week or the week before uh, last and I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. If you've ever been there, there's a big atrium in the, in the airport and there's all sorts of bad fast food you can get. And there are these long, tall tables with stools at them. And more than once, we were sitting there, we had a long layover, and, and you're eating with your friends, and then someone can't find a seat. And what happens in, in that moment? They kind of come to you, and they kind of awkwardly say, you know, is this seat taken? I mean, it's right next to you, you know? And why is that? Why don't they just sit down next to you while you're eating? Well, there's something deep and meaningful that happens. And I think this goes back to um, maybe something we've lost in our culture. Uh, we know, I think, by nature, that eating with someone it develops this relationship. It strengthens the bonds of friendship. In the ancient world, it was a covenant that was made between parties who sat down and ate together, uh, sealing this agreement they had made by breaking bread together. And that's what Jesus did. 
And I think when we awkwardly think, do I, am I, can I? <laughs> yes, Jesus invites you to this table if you have run by faith to him. Uh, this is a meal to strengthen your relationship with him. It's a meal that confirms his covenant that he's made with you. So if you are someone who has been baptized and has had God's name placed upon you in baptism and you have expressed that faith and been welcomed in a local church to this table, whether it's Heritage or another local church that preaches the gospel you've heard here today, uh, you're welcome to this table. And I would encourage you, if you have run one too many times this week against the closed door of doing and you're feeling down and you don't think you're welcome, this may be precisely what you need to do, and that is to come. If you have repented of your sin and your faith is completely and only in Jesus and not in your own doing, then come to this meal. Uh, this meal is, is gracious. This meal unites us with Christ in a way that, that we thankfully can celebrate once every week. So please come if that's you. If that's not you, if you have not been baptized or if you have, wouldn't call yourself a Christian, uh, then please don't come to this table. This table is meant for sinners, but it's meant for sinners who are in Jesus. So if that's not you, please use the prayers that are in your bulletin. Talk with someone you see serving or praying, uh, someone you see partaking this morning, and say, how can I know this Jesus who welcomes sinners to eat with him? And we would be delighted to have that conversation with you. Just a few words about how we celebrate the supper here. In a moment, I will read the words of institution. We will hear those in French, Spanish, and English, three languages represented in our congregation. Uh, and then we will pray and, and partake. Uh, you'll come forward row by row and receive the cup and the bread. Uh, there's gluten-free bread available as well. Take that back to your seats and we will all partake together once everyone has been served. Uh, to either side here of the table, there will be an elder present to pray with you or if you're here with your family, to pray with you and your family. So you could take advantage of that opportunity to be prayed for uh, by a fellow believer. I think that would encourage some of you this morning. Let me go ahead now and read the words of institution from 1 Corinthians 11. And then we will pray and partake of this sacrament of grace. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. En français pour les francophones, car j'ai reçu du Seigneur ce que je vous ai enseigné, c'est que le Seigneur Jésus, dans la nuit où il fut livré, prit du pain. Et après avoir rendu grâce, le rompit et dit, ceci est mon corps qui est rompu pour vous. Faites ceci en mémoire de moi. De même, après avoir soupé, il prit la coupe et dit, cette coupe est la nouvelle alliance en mon sang. Faites ceci en mémoire de moi toutes les fois que vous en boirez. Car toutes les fois que vous mangez ce pain et que vous buvez cette coupe, vous annoncez la mort du Seigneur jusqu'à ce qu'il vienne. Et par los hispanos hablantes en español, porque yo recibí del Señor lo mismo que les he enseñado, que el Señor Jesús, la noche en que fue entregado, tomó pan, y después de dar gracias lo partió y dijo, esto es mi cuerpo, que es para ustedes, hagan esto en memoria de mí. De la misma manera, tomó también la copa después de haber cenado, diciendo, esta copa es el nuevo pacto en mi sangre. Hagan esto cuantas veces la beben en memoria de mí, porque todas las veces que comen este pan y beban esta copa, proclaman la muerte del Señor hasta que Él venga. Father, as we come to this table, we pray that you would give us great joy and peace in believing. I pray that you would free us from doing. Uh, impress upon us the importance of this sacrifice for sinners that Christ has completely and finally given, that we remember in this meal. Lord, humble us to believe the gospel and because we believe it, uh, to, to live in fellowship and harmony with one another because all of us are on the same page before the cross. We thank you that we partake of one sacrifice for sinners and that because we partake of one bread, we are one in him. Lord, these are things that are too great for us to understand, but by your spirit, May we fellowship this morning uh, with the risen Christ and be strengthened by his grace. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Please come. Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take heed of it, all of you.
talking with the sinners, sitting with them around the table, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you. Take, drink of it, all of you. Amen. Please take out your hymnals. Our song of response will be Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Please stand if you are able. Number 529 in the Trinity Hymnal. Please hear now as we finish and we prepare to leave this place, but not too soon. Please stay for the fellowship meal. Uh, God's name put on us, his blessing put on us. We'll hear this from Numbers 6, 24 through 26 in French, Spanish, and English. Que l'Éternel te bénisse et qu'il te garde. Que l'Éternel fasse luire sa face sur toi et qu'il t'arrose sa race. Que l'Éternel tourne sa face vers toi et qu'il te donne la paix. El Señor te bendiga y te guarde. El Señor haga resplandecer su rostro sobre ti y tenga de ti misericordia. El Señor alce sobre ti su rostro y te dé paz. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.